That's the beauty of doing, taking my own work to the show, if you will. If I go and I get to witness you dancing to my music, like, it's nothing better for me. It takes some effort, but. So this kid dances to my music. He comes walking in at ACL, standing, staring at the blanket we were shot. It's a, it, for him, it's gotta be like this massive picture, right? Because you know, I was thinking if the kid liked it, like, that's how cool is it for a five-year-old to like one of my pictures? So they made their way over to the print bin and they're standing in front of the print bin and Finley can barely you know, see over it. He's like this. I heard his dad say, well, you can have this or you can have the shirt. You just can't have both, so you gotta pick one. And Finley looks up at his dad and he points at this piece. His dad looks at me and he goes, I guess we'll take this. And I said, I'll ship it to you, but I'm gonna ship it to him. What's your name, little guy? Cause I needed to know, I just needed yeah, to know. Right. What's your name, little guy? He said, Finley. And I said, well, let me tell you the story about this picture. But on the other side of the world is a country called Vietnam. And in the north, there's a lot of big mountains in the north. And there are people in those mountains that take a, a plant called indigo and they grow it and they pull it up and they boil it in water and they make colors with it out of the plant. And she makes blankets because it's in the mountain so it gets cold so she makes these blankets to keep her family warm. And they start to walk out and the, the father has this question mark above his head. He turns around and he says, man, I gotta share this with you. First off, I've never seen my son go beeline right towards a piece of art or anything like that. Like he likes you know, dinosaurs and Tonka trucks and like, and I don't understand why I have no, I, when he did it and I bought it, I still don't, I still didn't get it. But you told me this story Finley's named after his, gra his grandfather, his, his mother's father is Mr. Finley. He passed away two weeks ago. And Mr. Finley fought in the Vietnamese War. And I can't tell you why in the hell this is happening. I don't know. I think that this was a way that now his grandson can live with a beautiful giving image of Vietnam. On this episode of Establishing Your Empire, I host Greg Davis. Greg is an award-winning filmmaker and a photographer that is represented by the National Geographic Image Collection. He has worked his way from local festivals to international exhibitions, and his fine art prints continue to be sought after and hang in private and institutional collections worldwide. We talk about how Greg made a significant life change from a decade long career in technology to one of self-assessment and exploration and traveled the world camera in hand. We cover how to make the move from the corporate world to following your passion to becoming a successful artist that has sold seven figures worth of fine art prints. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography. But business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, we got Greg Davis here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thank you for so much for being here today. We got the new office set up, so this took a little bit of finagling to get it going, but I uh, really appreciate you being here. Honored to be the first time in the office. That's right. Uh, so why don't we start and just give us a little background of who you are and what you do. Yeah, I uh, currently at this moment in my life, I've uh, enjoyed this break in the pandemic, taking some time off, new homeowner out in, outside of Austin. Um, Come from a nice family from East Texas, same hometown for, we've been in that town for a little over a hundred years. So it's um, some heritage there. Um, what I currently do for work, it, you know, we'll get to that. I have a pretty interesting life over the last 15 years. I've made my sole income as a working photographer and selling art as, a, as, as my offering. I mean, I offer things like these beautiful pieces that you have behind you. Um, it's taken me all over the world. Um, all of the United States to show and share the work and then also shooting in different remote parts of the world. So it's been, been quite an adventure. So 15 years ago, you got into photography? Yeah, I was a tech guy before that. And how did, how did you start? That's the crazy part of this whole story. So I, uh, I'll, I'll start back in the beginning. I grew up in a small town in East Texas and um, my great grandfather came over um, by horse and buggy into East Texas and opened up a dry goods store on the corner of two dirt roads in a 
town called Livingston, Texas, about an hour north of Houston. Big pine trees, a lot of lumber, you know, was, um, that was really the main focus of the area in the beginning. Um, but people needed the dry goods, so we've still got the receipts from the family store from way back when. Uh, that was in 1900, I think it was 1904 is when they started, um, my great-grandfather and his brother. And then that was passed to my grandfather, passed to my dad. And then um, I was about to graduate from high school. I graduated in 87, and I was the high school newspaper photographer. My dad had an old AE-1 camera, and um, I thought, hey, let's grab the AE-1 and see what happens. It was an excuse to take pictures of the girls, first off. So I... I uh, I grabbed the eight one. It was film days, had the dark room. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was nothing in that early work that really said, this kid's got it, right? Dad asked me, what do you want to do, son? I said, uh, art school. He said, no, 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 son, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. What do you want me to do, Dad? He said, I want you to go to business school, get your Baylor business degree. Um, he had gone to Baylor. His dad had gone to Baylor. And their mother, great-grandmother, my great-grandmother had gone to Baylor. So bleed green and gold. Um, went to Baylor, put down the camera, um, didn't really take any photographs. This was, you know, in the early nineties, late eighties, early nineties. And, um, after graduation, I got into the tech world, early tech. And, um, you know, 15 years later, I woke up with at Dell and compact HP slinging hardware. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, this was late nineties into the early two thousands. And, uh, at around that time, I was around 30 to 35 years old. I'm 52 now, but around 30 to 35. And I kind of went through a personal valley of darkness, okay? This is not a light story, but this is what happened. The, 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 the ending is nice because I came out of it um, unscathed, if you will. I probably scarred a little bit, but I lost six family members died in a very short amount of time, um, probably about five years was about five of them my dad included my grandmother my dad my cousin my aunt uncle and then ultimately another two cousins and uh, i was attacked by a gang i've got 40 stitches in my head and neck from a violent gang attack a bottle over the back of the head uh, it was an initiation it was unprovoked i didn't have anything to do with it really i was just the target but was attacked from behind and then when i was on the ground was beat and fortunately got away, I was able to, I mean, fight or flight kicked in big time mm -hmm. and I uh, was able to scramble and get away uh, from the situation. Um, more to the sort of the, the pits that I was in, I lost all of my nest egg in a bad financial move, which was a significant amount of money because I'd been in tech for you know, at that point, for at, at that point, probably a decade. And, uh, and then I had a, a love of a girlfriend I was with that I loved dearly that, you know, did, did her thing behind my back. And so I was broken hearted. I was beat. I was battered. It Literally broke. and figuratively. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was in a really, really bad place. Um, I was not, uh, I was not healthy, you know, mentally. Um, I mean, did, did you have any bouts with the depression at that oh, time? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I was, I verifiably, um, and I was drinking and I was drinking pretty heavily. And I wasn't a friendly guy when I when it got to a point. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of insecurities. I had a lot of anger issues. Uh, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust anything. I didn't trust God. Everybody's dying. I didn't trust the system. It had stolen from me. I didn't trust women. I'd been cheated on. I didn't trust other people because I'd been attacked. I makes didn't trust sense. Anything that makes sense. So you know, like, uh, how can you live a happy life without trust? I mean, I, to me, it, you have to have trust that. And something greater and other people, you know, I, and your partner for sure. And I think a lot of people in the past year, maybe not all those items, but a number of those have had some tough times dealing with everything, especially when you took away some things like human interaction and the family members lost disinformation everywhere, not trusting information coming out. And the, un uh, the unknown of not knowing what's going to happen through all of this, right? And then add on drinking, right? On top of it, just a little bit multiplier there. Drugs even. Right. I mean, I, there's been probably some, some heavy lifting f for people through this past year and a half. Um, so my, my heart goes out to people. I certainly know what it feels like to be in a very challenging place 
And there is help out there. And I highly recommend talking to somebody about it. Um, I saw a therapist back then um, after the attack, really. But when that happened, that really kind of got me going the wrong direction. But the therapist was extremely beneficial. Um, he highly recommended that I quit drinking. And, um, and, and I, I call them God winks. It's the serendipity and the synchronicity and the things in our lives that line up that are sometimes hard to explain. Like, wow, hard to explain. Like, I'm like a, whoa, what just happened? You know, and trying to piece it together. How did that come about? Well, totally random. Um, this therapist, um, I had a really good conversation with him. He was a dude's dude. And um, during one of our conversations, he stood up and he said, Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm an alcoholic. He goes, let me tell you a story. And this was into it about a, maybe a month. He said, I was in a bar when I was, I forget how old he was at the time, 26 maybe. I was in a bar, and a bar fight broke out. And I wasn't necessarily the intended target, but I got a bottle over my head, right? And this is this is the guy that I went in for the thing. And I was yeah. like, "Are you kidding me? Are you, yeah, you're kidding me, right?" Like he's no. I was in a. Oh no, it was his throat. That's what it was. They got it wasn't a, it, it was it wasn't the back of the head. That was me. He it was a, he, it slit his throat and missed his jugular. Wow. So, yeah. So he said, "I I haven't had a drink since that day. I knew that my life was in was in the wrong place with the wrong people." And that was it. So I thought, how in the world am I coming in to talk about this? And this guy's had the same thing. He said, I recommend that you quit drinking. It'll try it. So in two, I forget the years now. I think it was 2003. No, it was the beginning of 2004. Quit drinking. Um, and the God winks started even more. The serendipity, the synchronicity. I, you know, I, There was one point in all of that depth in that depth, I rolled out of my bed. I was living in Colorado Springs at the time. And a lot of people asked me about, like, where were you when it happened? You know, what happened? How did and I could share the short story. And it, you say, I say Colorado Springs. And they're like, what? Colorado mm-hmm. Springs. But if you really think about I-25 as a corridor for the drug cartels, right out of Mexico, right through El Paso, right up through Albuquerque, right up through Pueblo, right up through Trinidad, right into Colorado Springs, right up to Denver, boom, you know, distribution in the central United States. And there are, I learned, there are, you know, there's presence in each of these cities for, for the cargo that's coming through, you know, and there's communication, hey, the cargo made it through because there's probably big money involved. And in Colorado Springs, there's presence of people that are working. Might be a smaller presence, but it's still there, right? I think in a lot of cities, like even Austin, you almost have to look for trouble, but there's still trouble for sure. It's, it, I've been here 25 years now, so I, I've seen a bit of a change. It's got some big city problems, and, for sure. and you start to witness that stuff on the streets more too. Just mm-hmm. some you know, monkey business going on and people doing things. You know that this doesn't feel right. Yeah, I've had some really interesting things with downtown Austin over yeah. the last five years. Just It's changing. It's changing. For you know, sure. It's still, still great. It's still, still an amazing great. place. Um, so it's big city problems are coming in here, but still so quit it. drinking. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then so, what? so quit drinking. And then these, these coincidences and, and oh, let me go back to that night that I had truly hit rock bottom mm-hmm. and I was in bed. It's probably three o'clock in the morning. I rolled out of bed and I, it was almost out of body. I, I remember rolling out and just was just at the bottom and was sort of afraid of where, where I was, you know, like mentally, I think I, I Wherever you are, whoever you are, you've got to come down here. You've got to help me. I, I need guidance. I need, I can't take any more pain. You know, I just had had it. And uh, the proverbial lightning struck. Um, I quit drinking soon after that. And uh, these, these things started happening. I was like, wow, you know, and I'd ask for this, these, these messages. I'd ask for, for help. I'd ask for change. You know, how did that, how did it show up for me? It showed up in these coincidences, this, this serendipity that showed up in my life and I started embracing them as language, um, and that led me to sell it all. The, the real, the, the last big one was um, out of the blue. Two friends of mine called me, a, a couple, and uh, 
And this was as, as things, I, had, I was pretty much getting close to making the decision. And then when they called and said, hey, we're going around the world for a year. You have any interest in going with us? I was like, and I hadn't talked to them in years. And I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, I'm in, you know, let's go. This, wow. is so, this was 05. This was like summer 05. No, no, sorry, it's summer 04. I got back summer 05. Um, and that was all I needed to hear. That was it. You know, I didn't want to necessarily go off by myself. I do now and it's fine. But for some reason, just where I was and post 911 and, you know, I just was like, it's a little bit sheltered. But at some point you got to, you know, just throw off the bowline and, and, and go for the adventure. And Well, and they gave you a little push. Might have, might have had to been a big push. So it doesn't sound like, but it, they gave you that little less like, and it didn't sound like you, it sounded like you were ready and didn't have a lot of excuses not to go. Like, I'm sure you could come up with them, but, um, you know, and sometimes we need something a little exciting to, sh- to jumble things a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't have near as a cool story, but I'll, uh, just small for me is I always wanted to move. And I came to Austin and it was great. It was fantastic. It, it was like, there was perfect weather and this and that. And I was just finally like, all right, like, what am How I doing? How long have you been here? Since 2008. Okay, cool. So I've been here for a bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've seen, seen a lot of change. <laughs> the downtown skyline is a little different. Yeah, little. yeah. But, you know, and then uh, and I had a buddy that I had one friend move here. That's all I needed, I think, was just one little, like, yeah. itty bitty. I'd move out of a job, nothing like that. But I had a couch to sleep on for a week or two until I figured need. it out, right? Um, and it's, you know, looking back, you're like, that's, that's it. That's all that made you push, spark. but a it's spark. spark. Yeah. It's a spark, right? Yeah. And if we're open to change, all we need is that spark and trust. It goes back to trust, right? I mean, Hey, you know, I trusted. Wow. You're calling, you know, this is, this is it. And so where'd you guys go? So I, I you know, now I'm going to cut back to 1987. Sure. I was the high school newspaper photographer, right? But I hadn't photographed really up until a little bit, you know, and before that trip, not much. So I was like, okay, I was shopping for a camera. I didn't want to take a big, fancy, expensive camera. I wasn't into cameras. I wasn't even shooting a lot of photos. This is obviously pre this, you know, so not, mm-hmm. not everybody was carrying a camera around. And so I went and bought an Olympus C750 point and shoot. I think it's 4.5 megapixel camera. It had a nice zoom, you know, and all the, you know, probably, probably $400 camera. That's all I thought about it. I thought I'm going to take some photographs. I set up a little bitty website. This was 04, so, you know, no social media. Mm-hmm. But I put together a little website just so I could have a way to communicate with family and friends. This would be the way that I'd communicate. And uh, planned on writing some stories so that I could bring people in that knew me, just share my experience with them, you know. It sounds crazy now, but 04, that was sort of a, a different world back then. And I thought I'll set up a little store too, and we'll maybe sell a few prints, and that'll help help with this, help me around the world, you know. And plan was for to go for a year, and uh, I'll cut ahead a little bit. Got home and had sold five hundred dollars worth of photos, and I thought, oh, well, man. that that's not going to work for five hundred dollars in a year, you know. So when I got home, I wasn't thinking that what was going to happen was going to happen. But I'll cut back to. The, the trip. But you did sell a couple of prints, so uh, five hundred dollars. Well, that's to family and friends, you know, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. to yeah. charity. Yeah, yeah, it's family and friends. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have. I, I, I can't. I don't. I feel bad giving you money, but I'll buy a print. Yeah, I'll trade you. I'll <laughs> trade you something for it. Yeah. So I didn't have a lot of confidence when I got home, but there's an interesting story about how things sort of changed um, regarding all that. And again, that's lessons, you know, in there that it may not look like something, you know, but with a little push, with a little putting yourself out there, with a little courage or this or that, you know, I mean, things can, can move on you in different directions, but you got to have some action, you know, mm-hmm. I think you got to move. We started uh, in Turkey and uh, we ended up going through, um, through Africa, over into Asia, uh, down into Australia and, and South Pacific and then back home, just chock full of beautiful, amazing situations. And also, but to be fair, some downtime, some loneliness, some what the hell am I doing here? Extreme loneliness, loneliness traveling like that and, and, and being with a couple that was a couple too. So that's kind of tough seeing them having a good time and stuff. They got their little thing, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, did that increase your trust in people seeing such different variety of people? Yeah. I think one of the main reasons for even going was this trust that I didn't have for for something greater, for people, for women, for the system, all this stuff I'd lost and, you know, 
I was looking to reconnect to that. I was looking to reconnect to people, regain my trust in people and women and the system and, and, and God. And, uh, and having to take, having to approach someone that you're attracted to and not in any sexual way, just to, there's, we have attraction to people. There's something in that person that we recognize. There's an old soul in there that we've come across or whatever it is, we're drawn to certain people and certain, for certain reasons. And, uh, these people that I was drawn to, I would have to approach them to photograph them. And it's not always the easiest thing to do. Not at all. You have to be extremely authentic and vulnerable to get the kind of work that I, that I shoot now. I mean, you really have to put yourself out there. And it's got to be coming from the right place. Mm-hmm. Or the photo- photograph's not going to come off well. You know, why are you making this photograph? And what is it about this person? And what can I have give back without throwing a bunch of dollar bills at a person? I, I don't... I don't, I don't like this, this idea of, because I've seen it turn bad in some places where now the people are expecting it and there's even gets to a point where they demand it and then it gets, it's a very inauthentic thing. But I like to travel with a small printer uh, and I'll give them, or I'll, I'll take a, a Polaroid and I'll give them a Polaroid photograph I love of themselves. that idea of a little small printer because I've, I've gone around and you get this really cool photo and you show them. And they're like, oh, and then it's that's gone. me, you know, yeah. and, then, and then I'm gone. And then it's gone. I'm gone and, and they're gone and the whole thing. And then um, what I w- do want to say there, and I think we're going to have a little theme here of this, this trust. Uh, you know, I, I think I've always known it without actually saying it out loud or thinking it directly is it's a massive trust thing when it, when you're taking photos of people, even in people who know what, you know, have had their photo taken a thousand times, all this. Well, even this. But, yeah, correct. Completely and utterly. And we, like, even for me, like I was saying before we jumped on was, you know, I do the filming thing and all that. And I think that is so people would trust me with a good product. They see other things, they do a nice website, doing all the things because I'm, you know, you know, almost asking for the trust of it. But then um, the secondary piece is uh, hoping that they trust to open up as you are, which I do really appreciate. And it's super interesting already. We just started. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's a big piece there uh, of, of photography. And I'm going to be thinking about this later today and probably for a while because um, I just did a shoot yesterday. And, you know, people, even people that are out there self-promoting can get really it's hard with a big camera in front of their face, you know, uh, they can really clam up unless you kind of can get them to open up for you and be themselves. Right. Well, you did a good job of that. And, you know, me knowing what I'm walking into and knowing this rig, these rigs and all that, but like, you know, talking, talking me through, just, just making me comfortable in your home here, you know, getting some water, showing me around the place, you know I mean? Gaining trust through just basic being authentic and conversational and sharing what you have, you know, um, that's a big part of sort of gaining that trust. Is, sure. Uh, without it, you know, you walk in and it, okay, what do I do? <laughs> but you put me at ease, so hats off, you know I mean? And that's part of, of uh, any kind of photography and video, video videography work is uh, making the subject at ease, you know? I've been on the other side of the podcast uh, being in your shoes and that's a little interesting sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so maybe that that's helpful, but I do appreciate well, it. I, I, I don't make any, here's my deal. I don't make any plans. I just come in here and whatever comes out of me through that into you guys. Thanks for listening. You know, I, um, there's no plan here. There's no agenda for me. It's just sharing the, the, the story behind how I got here and that's all I can do, you know, and my work is my work. And it, you know, it's, it, it speaks to people or it doesn't. And that's, mm-hmm. that, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a, a real agenda. I do like sharing my story though. I think it's, yeah. it, it can be if, inspiring for people, some not and some so. So, well, I, I think one of the big things, uh, sorry to interject, but is, is a lot of people want to become a photographer and you replace the word photographer with a lot of things. It's interesting that. You know, a lot of people have been in the corporate world like you have been, um, have been super depressed, especially this previous year and a half. So I think uh, it's uh, great to understand how you can go from one end to the other. And so to get back to the story, so you travel, you come back and then you're like, okay, I used to be making all this money. I made $500 and spent way more than that. Yeah. So what'd you do? So I had, so 
I didn't, after I lost, because I lost a lot of, I lost my nest egg in a bad financial move before I'd left, right? And so I had, and I don't mind sharing this, I mean, I had some stuff that was, I would never touch, but I had about $17,000 that, that, to my name. I mean, I had a little bit more just safety net stuff, but I had 17 that I could kind of get to, and so I didn't have much, okay? Mm-hmm. I had much before the, the bad financial move, I had enough, but, I, you know, I was like, you know what? I, I can't take any more. I'm out, man. I can't. I was just like, I can't take. And then all of a sudden, I'm off, taking off. I spent seventeen. I spent it all, seventeen thousand five hundred, on that trip, which is not a lot of money. Because so I was living really simply overseas and eating really simply. But that forced me into not forced is a bad word. That engaged me in the communities at that at, you know on the streets of India and in the mountain villages of, of Thailand or wherever it might be away from the tourist scene. Uh, and even in 04, it was just a different world. There was no Instagram and no social media. It just was a, it was a slower pace mm-hmm. of travel. There was still travelers for sure. And we cut, cut to getting back. I got back in, in uh, Austin 2005. You said you moved here in 08? 08, okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it wasn't that far off of 08. No. This totally different world back then, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, downtown didn't even feel like a big city. No, not at all. Dead zone down there. Yeah. Right? Back then. You could walk anywhere, too. It was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No Uber. You had to walk, right? (laughs) I had to walk. Yeah. (laughs) Trying to find a cab was the worst thing, too. I couldn't find him at two in the morning. They couldn't find him. Yeah. Stuck down there. Dude, you got to come get me. I can't get it. I walked. I walked. I had an apartment five and a half miles away. I walked home one night. I was like, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't figure it out. There was a limited was amount of cabs, and they were going to the yeah. airport anyway. So. Yeah, it was busy, and it was like... It's hilarious. I guess let's just start walking. Yeah, but we can remember when it was that, right? And uh, it was quaint and, and, and cute, and it was it, it seemed like it was more gel down there with, with some of the personalities, probably because I was hanging out there. I was working it. So I got back from the trip, and uh, some friends of mine that I grew up with in, uh, in Livingston, Texas, um, Brad and Chad Womack, who... Brad was the bachelor at one point, so they hit it really big in the in the TV world and brought a lot of attention to them and their bars. The mm-hmm. the MTV people came into town and the, the chugging is it chug uh, the Dizzy Rooster was the hangout for the MTV folks, and that was Brad and Chad's bar. So they were just hitting it on all cylinders with these guys, and they had a bar over on um, on uh, Red River called it's the Mohawk now, and it was called the Velvet Spade. So I contacted them and said, hey, I'm back from this trip around the world, and I don't want to go back to corporate America. Um, I've never bartended. You got a bar? Because they, they were opening new bars every week, it seemed like. And they said, yeah, we got one on Red River that we're just starting, and you can go over there and sling some drinks for us. And cool. So I was there, and uh, of course, talking to people at the bar, you know, before it really got, you know, busy at the bar. You had a few hours there of kind of the regulars that would come in and shoot the breeze and I got to talking about, oh, yeah, I just got back from this trip and, you know, kind of talking to people. And I talked about it enough to where one of the one of the brothers or the youngest brother, Wes, said, why don't you hang up some of your pictures in, in the bar here, you know, and be cool. And I was like, OK, I don't even know how to do that. But I'm, so I'm embarrassed to even say, but went to Costco and printed them and went to Walmart and got some frames. I'm, I'm mortified. Now that, that, but hey, I didn't know, and I certainly didn't have any money to custom frame and print it on mm-hmm. museum rag and all the stuff that I do now. But I printed up a, a dozen photos and stuck them on the walls at the Velvet Spade. And about a weekend, someone stole the one that was closest to the door. Right? I thought, you know what? They're good enough to steal. Maybe I. Maybe there's something else there. I, you know, who knew? That's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Uh, I'd love to meet the person who stole it and like just did not. Just to laugh, you know, because mm-hmm. it really did like, wow. And then I met a girl. Um, I was dating her and, and we were walking down West 6th Street. And what, back then, West 6th Street, there was there was uh, the little Irish pub that was yeah. down there. Uh, uh, Mother Egan's. Okay. Yeah, there was just a couple of them. A couple, right? Well, right next to Mother Egan's was a little blank, little open parking lot. that's still there, actually, surprisingly. But it was an art market. Like kind of like the ones they have on down on South Lamar, I'm South Congress. And the girl she elbows me and says, "Hey, why don't you go in there and see what's what that's all about?" Because she had seen my photos and was like, "Oh wow, these are amazing!" I'm like, "Oh, thank you, honey." You're supposed to say that. She goes, "No, seriously, go in there and check it out." So I went in and I 
I said, Hey, who, who runs this outfit? What's this? Is this an art? Like, can I, if I have some things I want to offer? The guy was like, yeah, go back there. The guy named with goatee named Wayne, go talk to Wayne. So I went back, talked to Wayne. I said, Hey Wayne, I'm, I'm Greg Davis. And, uh, my girlfriend, Christine, that she says, I've got some photos that might do well in a place like this. And how does this work? You know? And he said, well, um, we'll set you up a tent. The first time you do it, I'll set you up a tent and we'll get you some walls. And it's $25 a day to do it. And I looked at her and I was like, 25 bucks a day. Why not try it? And I already had the work. I already knew kind of like I had to print and frame them cheap at that point Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of the, because of the bar, uh, work. And so he said, well, just do that next weekend. Come back and give us, give us a try and see what you got. So I went and went back to the, Costco and Walmart. I'll whisper that. Um, and then are these are still the same travel photos, or are these? This new? is from that one year. Yeah. That's from that. Yeah, this was just a few months after I'd gotten back from this one year trip. So yeah, this is still the original from that little Olympus point and shoot. Yeah. So I mean, I literally had to go through the little website that I had set up for myself, and was like looking through them and going, okay, which one of these do I print now that I've got a, this opportunity to to show? So how did that first day go at the art market? Yeah, so I went and pr- printed them, framed them. Uh, he had the walls, he had the tent. Um, came out there, backed in the truck, you know, and hung hung the little had little hooks. I'd made little business cards, and um, did you have like twenty prints, something ten prints. Yeah, probably. I have, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I took a photograph of my very first day because I speak on like I speak to at University of Texas and to to some schools and uh, some groups and things like that, and I always bring that in as part of the the story which is because now my work's big and it's you know i got my own studio and it's it's big and bold and back then it was i call it my chicken coop days you know it was really simple but the first that's great foresight that you knew i mean you're obviously a storyteller through and through that you knew that there was a story there I for guess, yourself i guess I because this isn't in the days that, where you just pulled out your phone yeah you no, had to like well power on a little point and shoot or whatever well, you know that was part of the story too was i took these photographs with that you know so i kind of thought you know what i need to bring that with me i need to bring that with me because that is kind of a thing because it wasn't a professional grade camera it was a current camera you know but it wasn't a professional grade camera and the photos were i were really nice you know from that from that that camera um first day knew it I knew I was. I knew this is what I was supposed to do with my life. Did you sell anything that first day? Oh, I did. I really? Made, back five hundred bucks. The next weekend, I sold a thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. At the stuff. little shops. Yeah. I didn't even know people did well in those mm-hmm. things. Yeah. So the next weekend, my second weekend, I doubled my uh, grand. And I was like, wait a second. There's fifty two weeks in this year, and I just did a thousand bucks. Okay, yeah, I got cost of goods and blah blah blah. But I was like, well, I hadn't even really tried yet, you know. So mm. I, I got, I got a shot at this, you know. Immediately, it was obvious, and people were, you know, about, I hate to keep using this reference, but Instagram was not around. So the world, even in '04, was a, a more closed place that we didn't have access to the imagery and the awe that was what I was seeing and bringing home, and the and the spirit behind it too. Of course, helps. It wasn't just a snapshot. There was soul, and spirit, in the work out of that first um uh, collection was your was, which one did the best or which one was your favorite that's a great question because i didn't know right i went out to my little rinky dink website and i pulled off you know selected the photos okay i think this one's good i think that one i mean it's what i liked right and then I, i'd been out there probably three weeks maybe a month and there was a girl who came to the bar she was a regular named sarah and uh I'm trying to think how this story went because I haven't told it in so long. She came out. She, she, I knew her from the bar. She came to the to the little market and said, uh, she came up to me. She goes, I, know, I don't see it here, but I know the one that I want. And I was like, what, which one? She goes, the hands. I go, the what? She goes, the hands, the blue and the green hands. I was like, I had to think. Like, oh, wait a second. Okay, Vietnam. So I had to go out to my own site and select the image that I hadn't selected as the first edit, you know, or the first edit of what I was going to print. And I pulled it off and I printed a few extra just in case because I knew she wanted one. She came the next weekend. She got it. And those other two sold. I can't, so you, you shot that photo because that's, that's still a big photo for you, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And so you shot that on like a little Pentax. $400 point and shoot. And Olympus. Yeah. Yeah. And point four hundred dollars back then. This is worth like 30 cents nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is important because a lot of people think that you have to have this newest, craziest. I mean, I shot with a 7D for a long time. Yeah. The phone nowadays is better than 90% of the stuff we used to use back then. Um, but the motivation when you have a camera, you know, sometimes you'll, um, there's some benefits there to have a DSLR. It's going to motivate you to do well, some stuff. And print. In print. Yeah. yeah, you can print something small with this. Okay, but sure. I'm in the I'm in the print game. You know. Yeah. A quality yeah. print game. You know. Yeah, but it's st still important that you know. Yeah, you can get to where you you are now with uh, you know getting a real expensive camera, but it doesn't mean you have to start with that. Right? That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't and you don't have to print big in the beginning to make it work. I was you know my biggest was an eleven by fourteen print, and then I'd frame it to maybe sixteen by twenty and. You know, uh, back then I maybe offer it for 250 bucks or something, you know, and I had probably 50 bucks in it, you know, and it was enough, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, it was a plenty. I was starting a new thing, you know, and uh, I wasn't even sure it was going to work. I mean, I, I knew that people were really responding on an emotional level. And that's important, I think, when you're offering anything is people need to feel connected to that thing that they or collecting or purchasing or or whatever it is or e even if they're just enjoying it you know it doesn't have to be something they hang out on their in their house so okay you you have that thousand dollar day you're like hey i'm gonna full-time so and you're selling some stuff how did you move to the next step of like okay i'm gonna be a, a photographer now like i'm gonna yeah. take more photos well i at that point i continued doing that and i kept hearing about you know um these other like larger, more regional uh, city run art festivals. And again, I'm going, going back to when I didn't know anything, right? So I was like, oh, they, oh cities. And I didn't come from art. I didn't come from the, the, the market. I didn't know anything about it. There wasn't a lot of information. There was no YouTube. Um, so yeah, I, every city has an annual, large, juried, Juried, juried means that the artists are selected. The artists apply, and then they have a professional jury normally run by a museum curator, local gallery owner, maybe the previous year's best of show of that show. The next year, they'll put up slides, and they'll select, you know, and they only select a certain amount of artists and a certain amount of artists within categories. So it's only, you know, 10 photographers out of 200 applications or something to keep the quality of the show high. Not all shows are like this. The good ones that I like to do are um, like to get in. I don't always get in them either, but the ones I like to do when I'm get it when I get in. So I learned about these these shows. I'm like, oh wow, okay. And then I kept having people would come by my space in Austin at this little small art market, and they kept saying, "There's a well." A few times they were like, "There's a girl at the at the Austin show, which is the big city show that I hadn't yet." It was. Uh, I think I'd been doing it at that point in like six months, and that's when the, art, the show was. They're like, there's a girl over there named Lisa Christine. She's out of San Francisco, and her work and your work have a really, there's something going on there, like similar vibes. And so I had to look her up and was like, wow, that's quite a compliment because Lisa Christine was very, very talented. Um, and I kept hearing that over and over, still at this little art market. You know, even after that, after the big show in Austin had gone away and everybody for the weekend was over but over the course people had seen that work and then they would make their way to the, and they'd go your work reminds me of somebody i was like lisa christine they're like that's her how'd you know that i was like i keep hearing that over and over and over you know and she had been doing what she does for at least maybe a decade or more so she was sort of this original inspiration of like oh wow makes her living as a photographer offering her beautiful pieces framed for for homes you know and uh and then, you know, ultimately I got to a point where I was like, I, I'm, I'm, I, that's my direction. I'm going to go that direction and start doing these shows, applying for these shows. And, yeah. And then um, where was the next breaking point, right? So you got, you got a little bit of money so that you could actually, you know, pay your bills a little bit. But, mm -hmm. but like where, where we, we, I think we got a whole different couple levels until you're today. So oh, what was yeah. kind of another yeah, sure. kind of big piece? Yeah, that was... That was just starting to go from sort of this small time um, art market to, okay, now I'm starting to do regional, you know, of course, the one in Austin, Houston has the Bayou City Arts Festival, 
Fort Worth Main Street, it's a massive show. 300,000 people go to it and there's money in Fort Worth and they collect art. They've got a great thing going in Fort Worth with Eamon Carter, with Kimball. They got a better art scene in Fort Worth than we've got here in Austin. I, I, people are going to kill me to say that, but from a museum standpoint. So, oh, well, that's completely not, true, Not actually. necessarily from the art, art standpoint. I, I don't want to make that comparison because there's great art in both, but from a purely um, museum standpoint, you know, think it's a deeper steeper roots there austin's getting Absolutely. austin's way better than it's been right but there was a time in austin where it really struggled um with bringing in proper museums but it, it's it's yeah it's it's way better than it was and it'll continue to get better with funding and people focusing on it and um but fort worth it's a great show and then you've got i mean milwaukee has their museum amazing architectural museum looks like a bird this it opens and closes not not over time just it opens sometimes when the winds are right beautiful architectural building chicago old town is a great show so you have these really highly juried shows and it takes a particular type of artist to do these types of shows not all artists want to do it because it's mm-hmm. extremely difficult you're at the mercy of the weather you're at the mercy of people and, you know anybody can say anything they want and anybody can you know so it's not for everybody it's a very difficult way to make a living um but offering art is it's just a challenge to do it but it's extremely rewarding and i wouldn't choose it any other way and, and i've been able to meet amazing people travel all over the world but it started from that little LAD. that little show to to the regionals and then um more nationwide and i think i i, I don't know if the big break, but it, maybe it was the big break. Um, there's been a lot of big breaks, actually, you know, over time. But in 2010, I had driven out to 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 uh, West Texas, out to Marfa, to celebrate my birthday. And my girlfriend at the time and I were coming back. In the, yeah, 2010, right. We're coming back. And out in West Texas, you know, you're off the cellular network. And, you know, there's a point where you hit Sonora, maybe, or somewhere. But you hit cellular service and all of a sudden the phone starts going off right and so my phone beeped a couple of times and dinged a couple of times and i'm driving it's straight away but said hey could you check that and actually no i tell you what i did i forget when like this i looked down and saw it real quick and it said ng contract and i handed it to lauren lauren i said hey please read that for me and she opened up the the email and said oh my god pull the car over right now we pulled the car over and danced in the desert that night. National Geographic had contacted me and offered me um, to be represented by their image collection, which is their agency at National Geographic. So I've been with them. There's been a lot of changes recently with Disney buyout and the Fox buyout before that and a lot of structural changes with Nat Geo. But uh, for 10 years, I was represented by their image collection. So supporting content was sent to my editor there and just like huge, I mean, amazing. And, and I met them. Um, I don't really ever know how it happened for sure, but I'm, I think a lot of different things. But one thing that definitely happened was I was showing my work at the Armadillo Christmas Bazaar, which is a one of these art art uh, festival things that happens during Christmas here in Austin. Amazing heritage. Um, the Armadillo has been going on 41 years. Uh, there's three bands a day. What I will ask is before, because I'm a big believer that you can uh, increase the surface area of your luck by doing some stuff. Um, how many shows do you think you did before you landed the National Geographic contract? Yeah. So the, the, the way that went down was I was at the Armadillo and I'd been doing shows, well, 2010, 2005 to 2010. So five, five years. And I would probably averaged 20 a year, 20 mm-hmm. shows. So uh, it was a hundred. Oh yeah. Over a hundred. Yeah. Probably. At least around there. And it happened that next door. And that was the year that the Armadillo was at the, um, at the convention center. They were between the Austin music hall and now where they are at the Palmer but they were at the convention center and next door was a national geographic book sale. They were getting rid of all their books from the year, the end of year sale. And, um, someone from the organization knew someone that I knew and they had told her about me and she came over and walked in and and said, hi, I'm, you know, so-and-so from national geographic. And of course I was straightened up immediately like, Whoa, this is, you know, 
And she goes, do you mind if I have a look at some of your work? No, please, <laughs> please. And she walked in and she had her hands kind of behind her back. You know, she was looking up and I, could, I was trying to like get, get an idea of what, you know, how was she responding? But this woman sees the best photographs and some of the, you know, arguably some of the best photographs in the world, you know, and she didn't give me much response, um, which is, which was fine. And she turned around and we talked for a second and uh, she says, well, it's nice to meet you. I've got to get back over to the, the cell, you know, off she went. And I thought, well, wow, that was cool. But I didn't know what I expected, but mm -hmm. wow, that close, you know? Yeah. Like, and then six months later was when we were out in, in Marfa and coming back and this thing showed up and they got, you got on their radar for just sure. Just a huge compliment, a huge honor to be even in the company and i would go to dc annually to their their gatherings and uh, still keep in contact with a lot of the people that were that i met tell me about a photo any photo uh that you just kind of remember whether there was some you know intense person or some emotion that it came up positive or negative just something that happened that it, that with one of your photos whether it's a photo that you sell or not you know yeah i mean i, I never did finish the story um it's about this image but i never did Great. really finish the story um going back to the girl sarah that was at the bar who said hey i found this 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 image of the, the blue and the green hands and you know and, I, and this image was captured it's it's i call it the blanket weaver and it's indigo dyes on one woman's hands so it's a blue and a green hand and uh, I was on a trail in far north of Vietnam, nine months into this one year trip around the world, nine months, the cycle of birth. I feel like at that moment on that trail, when I took that one shot, um, I was coming down I was in a village called Sapa up in the north. And I was kind of coming down into this valley and this woman was coming up from below and we kind of, our paths metaphorically, literally crossed, but you know, there it was. And that was the moment right there. She was right in front of me. Full traditional dress, black mong, pillbox hat, embroidered earrings. Um, and walking in front of me, maybe 30 yards, and, and her hands were flashing blue and green as she walked. And I was just, wow, you know, it's me and her. Hustled up behind her, tapped her on the shoulder. She turns around, sees me, freaks out. Like, like it was, you know, I had to gain trust real fast. I bowed, made myself smaller, put my hands up, you know. And then I went with a question because I didn't speak Vietnamese, but it's on like your pointing hand. to her hands. What's on your yeah. Hands? yeah, what's on your hands? Yeah, right. Yeah. It's just like, and it loosened her up, and mm -hmm. I could see her kind of start. I saw her wheels turning. Like, how do I? She went. Oh, so she's showing that the, the, you're weaving she, in case this was audio, and then, right? And then she did this, and she yeah, did this. Yeah, clapping and I, your hands. So I didn't really so. know, you know. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, but I, at that time, I didn't know that they, I mean, of course, they worked with Indigo, but I didn't know kind of yeah. what was going on. And she was, it sounded like she was a little bit excited to show you. She was like, a little bit, yeah, actually. This is yeah. what I do. This is who, what I know, do. This, this guy's I interested. Wow, cool. And there, it's a, there's tourists going through there, so it wasn't a completely like, oh, my gosh, white man's in the middle of, the, you know. Right. It was just sort of startling to her, I think, more than anything. But there's a lot of tourism. They even teach the younger Hmong uh, girls and, 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 uh, and boys in, in school how to speak English. Right. So, you know, um, she, this woman, did not speak it, but we got through it, and and I just said, "Hey, uh, something, something told me just have her hold her mouth." Okay, I took one picture, and she looked at me like, "This guy's crazy." <laughs> Bye. Okay. Yeah. See and take I took a photo of my hands, and I looked, and that was it. You know, and then uh, you know, three months later, I'm back home. One one photo. You didn't take like seventeen hundred. You know, like how we do nowadays with DSLRs. One photo. One photo. One photo. And put it away. Yeah. And then this Sarah at the bar says, hey, I found the one, the blue and the green hands. I'm like, I had to think about it. So I went back out, printed a few extra. Now cut to, I don't remember what year, but I showed my work at ACL, Austin City Limits Music Festival, for 13 years. Uh, there's an art market on the grounds and uh, always an amazing experience. Worldwide exposure, met the coolest people, sold a lot of artwork, believe it or not. Um, I ship and deliver, so I didn't have to walk out with them, you know. But uh, a story, you, and there's a there's a bazillion of these. Um, this one just came to mind because I just told it two days ago too uh, to my nephew. And uh, so there was a, I, I want to say it was probably 2016, we'll call it, I think it was 2016. 
And what's crazy is I could probably tell you, this is how I have about 8,000 contacts in my contact list. This syncs with my, my Mac. Mm-hmm. And his name was Finley. Let me look up and see if he's here. Finley. Finley Atkins. ACL 2017. Little five-year-old that bought my blanket weaver. So this kid is walking by my booth with his dad and he lets go of his dad's hand and his dad kind of goes, Hey, where are you going? And I'm sitting in the space, you know, the space is about this size. And I watch this child walk across and he breaks hands with his dad. And his dad's like, Hey, where are you going? And the kid beelined like straight into the booth and was standing there looking up at the blue and the green hands, the banquet weaver, just like, and I, was like I was watching this whole thing happen. Like, oh, and I've, I've seen it before. I just, I, I, that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of doing taking my own work to the show, if you will, and being there too. Because a lot of times it's somebody else showing it, and just be it, to interact with people, be a witness, and, and also to get some of that feedback. Understand which even what not just what people buy, but what did people stand and see and interact with, and seem like they they had emotional draw to be a witness. And this guy brings his own work; he gets to watch people dance to his music. I like watching people dance to my music. If I were to put it in a gallery, and I'll, here's how that works. I put it in the gallery. Okay, we have an opening night. But after that, it's in the gallery. I walk over to the mailbox, open the mailbox. Wow, a check. <laughs> hmm. Put that in the bank. Sure. Nothing there for me. Yeah. Okay, right, nothing there right. for me. A paycheck, whatever. I've had a paycheck. If I go and I get to witness you dancing to my music, like, it's nothing better for me. It takes some effort. But so this kid cool. dances to my music. He comes walking in at ACL, standing staring at the blanket we were shot. It's a, it, for him, it's got to be like this massive picture, right? And it's abstract too, so it's not clearly hands. It is, but it's, it's an abstract, and they're different colors. Like he's never seen anything like Colorful, it. yeah. He's five. So I was really curious. So I kind of took a few steps over, kind of nonchalantly, you know, and kind of eavesdropped in a little bit on the conversation. And his dad leaned down to him. His dad says, well, son, it's... One thousand ninety-five dollars, and the kid went, kind of shook his head like this. And it was, he's five; he doesn't really the numbers thing. Maybe still kind of figuring out what that means. One thousand ninety-five dollars. So he kind of walked around, and I had a pretty, pretty big space. And he walked kind of back in the back and around, and he was just looking up at everything. And I couldn't help myself, so I, I went over. I have a little print bin that I sell little thirty-five dollar prints, right? And I walked over and I said, "Hey, just so you know, I've got little ones that aren't so." Much because you know, I was thinking if the kid liked it, like that's how cool is it for a five year old to like one of my yeah. pictures? Like, you know, it's yeah. not about selling 35 bucks, but I've got little ones, you know. If you so they made their way over to the print bin and they're standing in front of the print bin, and Finley can barely, you know, see over it. And he's like this. And I took a few steps closer again because I saw him getting in a conversation and I heard his dad say, Well, you can have this or you can have the shirt, ACL shirt, you can either have this or you can have the shirt. But you can't have both. You got to pick one. And Finley looks up at his dad. And he points at this piece. His dad looks at me and he goes, I guess we'll take this. Huh? Wow. Right? And he goes, we'll buy it, but if, only if you sh- can ship it to us. And I said, I'll ship it to you, but I'm going to ship it to him. What's your name, little guy? Because I need to know. I just need to yeah, know. Right. What's your name, little guy? He said, Finley. I said, okay, Finley, I'm going to ship this picture to you. Finley Atkins said, where do you live, Finley? What's your address? And he said, he looked up at his dad. He's like, one, six, seven. His dad, I liked his dad. was like, wanting him to learn his address, right? So yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah. One, six, seven. And he got it right. So we, yeah. Okay, cool. I said, well, it's going to be about two weeks for, for it to come in the mail. And, and uh, you know, here's my card. Let me know if you guys don't get it. And uh, why do you like that picture so much, Finley? And he's five. He says, you know, I don't know. It's just interesting. It's one person who has a two-colored hand. You know, be five, right? And I said, well, let me tell you the story about this picture. I said, in the far north, I said, if you, if you go to the other side, of, and I'm talking to a five-year-old, so I watered it down five-year-old mm-hmm. style. I said, on the other side of the world is a country called Vietnam. And in the north, there's a lot of big mountains in the north. And there are people in those mountains that take a, a plant called indigo, and they grow it, and they pull it up, and they boil it in water, and they make colors with it out of the plant. They make the blue, and they make the green, and they make... 
other colors from other things, right? But this woman made indigo dye with these, and she makes blankets because it's in the mountains, so it gets cold. So she makes these blankets to keep her family warm. Yeah, five-year-old story. So he was just like, wow, okay, cool. And they say, okay, thank you. Say, okay, it'll be two weeks. And they start to walk out, and the, the father has this question mark above his head as he walks out. It's just like, I could tell by his face. He's just going. As he's walking out, he's shaking his head. And he turns around, and he says, man, i got to share this with you. He goes, first off, Finley, wait there, wait there. First off, I've never seen my son go beeline right towards a piece of art or anything like that. Like he likes, you know, dinosaurs and Tonka trucks and Legos or whatnot. Cartoons. Like, yeah, cartoons, like nothing like, like, and I don't understand why I have no, I, when he did it and I bought it, I still don't, I still didn't get it. But you told me this story. I just got to share with you. I don't know why, but I'm just sharing with this with you because I, Finley's named after his, gra- his grandfather, his, his mother's father is Mr. Finley. He passed away two weeks ago. And Mr. Finley fought in the Vietnamese War. Oh, my. And I can't tell you why in the hell this is happening. I don't know. But I just wanted to share that with you. So for me, it kind of gives me chills to think about yeah, it. I don't intense. know what's happening behind the veil, right? We don't know yeah. what's happening behind the veil. Like Finley's grandfather's spirit is still could be around. Yeah. Finley's grandfather, I guarantee you, had some trauma from his what he saw in Vietnam. Most likely. I don't know. But... Probably did, right? And genetically, we're passing our DNA and our genes down to through, you know, our children. And so I think that this was a way that now his grandson can live with a beautiful giving image of Vietnam. Right. And this is open. So open. openness as opposed to closed, right? The hands uh, facing up. Man, that's so interesting. Um, okay, so so you have like now much more successful photographer, get to do it full time, which to most photographers that's success in its own self and you've gone through a, a bunch of uh ups and downs obviously along the way any advice you'd give like your high school self your your you know you're doing the yearbook self anything you would say to yourself back then Oof, that's a good question because we can all use advice, even now. I mean, give, give me some advice. It's always good to have mentors. It's always good to have people in front of you have, have gone down this path, you know. It would have been amazing. I mean, I, I, I'm happy with the way things are, but it really would have, what would have happened if I would have gone to that art? If, when, and I said, when dad said, Where do you want to, what do you want to do, son? Art school? If, if I would have gone to art school and really used the gift maybe it wouldn't have been a gift at that point maybe i wait needed to wait so you don't you can't question what mm-hmm. it is you know like it it happened the way that it happened and i'm happy that it happened that way it's it's i wouldn't change it advice to the young man um just you know back then i didn't have a clue i just be authentic and 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 treat people with kindness and don't sweat the small stuff and you know the, just and try to find purpose in your life, you know, try, you know, have faith, devotion, and purpose. And uh, that's, we're all here to connect to something greater than ourself, you know, or, or we have, or we've given up hope completely and don't be- believe. And that's, that's one way to live and that's okay. But I think most of us are looking to connect to something greater than ourself. And where do we find that connection? And how do we find that connection through our partner, through our, you know, our work, uh, through our communities? You know, what about any regrets along the way? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because they've all been learning experiences, you know. I mean, the attack, you know, I could say, well, I've kind of regret walking into that bar that night or whatever, you know, or walking into that situation that night. But Uh, you're such a different person because of it. It it really changed my life, you know. Um, Bad shit can. Can I say that on here? Oh, you can say anything you want. I, I Bad also, shit can happen to all of us, right? And 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 it and it's it can be the biggest blessing ever. And it was, it is. You know, I I I've forgiven the guys. It took me a while to forgive them, and I think I think that forgiveness is is huge. And and the word you can say the word I forgive them, but you know when you've truly forgiven someone, um, because you can let go. Totally. Yeah, you don't forgive them if you're still holding on, right? 
You're and still carried freedom. around the sack. It's freedom when you can let go. It's hard to do. It is. So I end every podcast with this question, um, but and it'll be my last question. So how would you like to be remembered? Well, fortunately, I'm in a visual art, you know, uh, and I could simply say, you know, my work is going to live on. Um, and through my art, I would like to be known through the art. I mean, that's going to be my voice when I'm gone. Right. So I could could lean on that and say, you know, in the work, you can see the spirit, you can see the empathy, you can see the compassion for others. You can see the we are one in the work, I hope. That's where it's coming from. Okay. It's coming from, why can't we all just get along? Let's all realize how beautiful we are individually, no matter where, what we are, where we're from, who we are, what we, even the stuff we've done. Even if you have been a bad person, it doesn't mean you can't move out of that. I mean, you can move through that. So uh, hopefully the work you know, will be a, a voice for me once this physical body is gone. Um, at the end of the day, it's about family and about community and being important and, and giving to those in your immediate circle, I think. You know, you, we all have reaches, you know, and those reaches are important, but it ultimately comes down to that inner circle and just trying to be real and authentic and have conversations that have meaning. And, uh, you know, there's a, in Mexico, the Day of the Dead, they believe that you die twice. The first time that you die is when your physical body passes. The second time that you die is when your name is last spoken. All right. And it might be a while for yours, especially with the work. I, you know, I'm not going for fame. It's a, it's a slippery slope. I see it. I've witnessed it in other people. And um, I'd like for the work to be known and I'd like for the work to really speak to people and they really feel um, connected to, to that. It's all about them, you know, at the end of the day. It's about educating people through the work, but it's also about, and I get to witness this. That, that's the beauty, again, that goes back to me hustling the way that I hustle and getting the work in front of people and me being there. Is I get to witness the connection that's made. So it's this triangle. I'm impacted and co-creating the work with the subject, bringing it to someone else who's then having their own individual experience of that. And so what a gift. Well, Greg, it's been a big pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Uh, GregDavisPhotography.com. Um, and I'll have a bunch of all your social links in the, um, in the show notes. But man, I enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah I enjoyed it. It was great. Right, man. Thank you so much. Cheers. Yeah.